and welcome to a new season and a new series of Home Ground. Over the next four weeks, we'll be celebrating the richness of rural life. It's people, places and stories. And here's what's coming up on tonight's programme. Home ground goes underground. There's a honeycomb of abandoned mines under our feet, and these days they've got some new inhabitants. It's one of the busiest harbours in Ireland, so what will Brexit mean for the fishing industry in Kilkee? And I've been finding out how the humble trout is helping save an endangered species in the Ballanderry River. We're not trying to take all the fish out of this section of the river. OK. Because we obviously want some fish to spawn here. That doesn't make uh, me feel as bad, no. <laughs> But first tonight, we're here in County Fermanagh at the Crum Estate, where preparations are underway to open the doors to the public after the winter break. On the shores of Upper Loch Erne, Crum is one of Ireland's most important conservation areas and surely enjoys one of the best locations. The estate is home to all sorts of wildlife and plants, but something that sets this place apart is the abundance of important woodland and trees. It's sort of 50-50 makeup, so 50% woodland on the estate, 50% trees, so a thousand acres of each. OK, so it's fair to say the trees are part of the main attraction here. Oh, definitely, yes. Um, with the largest area of oak woodland in Northern Ireland. Wow. But, of course, it's not all about the oak trees. No, definitely not. Look at these. So, yeah. <gasps> the ewes. How old are these? To be honest, that's debated quite a bit. Um, and that basically all boils down to the fact that if you look at the trees, both of them either side, yeah. there's loads and loads of stems sort of all twined and joined together. Mm. So to get an accurate age is difficult. But the best estimate is that the female tree, which is this tree here, is somewhere about 500 years old. Mm -hmm. And then the male tree, it's thought it's about 100 years younger, so around about 400. Very naive question. How can you tell this is female and that's male? This time of year, with the female, it's a little bit difficult to tell, but the female has red berries in sort oh. of the autumn, winter time. Yeah. And then actually, at the minute, you can see on the male tree the flowers. You can see them on the outside as sort of the wee yellow. Little yellow flowers growing. Imagine, you know, 500 years. Mm -hmm. The stories this tree could tell. And they're pretty famous too. Yes, they are indeed, yeah. Um, they would be on several sort of registers of ancient trees, veteran trees and whatnot. Going back in the 1600s, there's records of them being wrote about, about O'Neill bidding farewell to his love under the already ancient U of Crom and stuff like that. So there's, they go right back in the history books. They're really special. It's lovely to be here. Yeah. And there's something magical about this place. Not just the look of the twisted and gnarled wood, but here underneath the canopy, it feels like a different world. It's like stepping into a fairy tale. Is there a lot of work in maintaining these ewes? To be honest, we sort of let them leave them at it. Um, they don't grow massively quick. And the only thing we would step in with, if, say, there was a branch hanging right down or something like that, or something that was obviously dangerous, we might remove that. Mm -hmm. But to be honest, we try and step back and, and don't really interfere with them. But other trees here do need attention. The winter months are the important time of the year for conservation on the estate, with rangers hard at work making sure the estate is at its best as it opens again to the public. Today is about making sure the trees are cleared of dead wood and any signs of disease. This is a tree uh, on the entrance avenue that's identified as showing the first signs of a bit of dieback. So just as a preventative measure, they're looking at taking this limb away here that's extending over the avenue, just in case if ever it came down on the avenue or on a windy day. So. Yeah, I guess That's you've got visitors to... coming in and out here yeah, all the time, so it, yeah. it poses a bit of a safety risk. But yeah. die back, did you say? Uh, just at the very ends, you maybe be able to see, especially just out this side, some of the tips of the branches. They're just not looking very healthy. And why just is that? Have they just weathered? Is that just age? It could just be age as well, but there's some fungus here in the far side as well, so there's probably some... Oh, yeah. Something that worked here in this tree, you know, but it's not, that's not uncommon on an old tree like this. How old but would this tree be? Crack, yeah, it could be 200 years old, possibly, or yeah. fairly close to it, anyway. 
Collins been working on trees here for over 15 years and he certainly knows a thing or two about how to climb them. Do you find that the trees on the estate require special treatment generally? There's a lot of veterans or a lot of old sort of mature trees here so you don't like working on them unless you have to and that's probably the National Trust's policy here is just only sort of really do things if they have to, if it's a danger to either buildings or, or people. I'm just going to go out that limb now, Joe. OK. Probably about halfway or so, and then take those bits off at the end. Is there a danger that in taking that quite significant branch off there, Colin, you could cause damage to the rest of the tree? There, uh, <laughs> there would be a slight risk that you're creating a large wound in the tree that sort of pathogens can get into the tree. But you've got to weigh these things up with the risk to the public as well. The tree's declining in health, so it just makes sense to take this off just as a preventative measure. I'll make sure the final cut leaves the minimum surface area for any pathogens to get into, so we'll hopefully do the best we can for it. Trees generally they store their kind of defense mechanisms just sort of at that branch collar, which is just about here. So we're going to try and take it off at sort of what roughly 90 degrees to that branch collar. So not too flush in with the stem. And that'll give the tree the best chance to sort of protect itself against infection coming in through that wound there. Yeah, I'm happy enough with that, Joe. That's... Any more we get into the tree itself, so I'm happy enough with that. Good. Cup of tea time. Now, did you know there's an underground maze of old mines beneath the Northern Irish countryside? I've been to Mollusk in County Antrim to discover this hidden world and the things which live there. This might just look like regular farmland, but hidden beneath my feet is a labyrinth of tunnels, physical reminders of our mining past. Today, I'm at Lyle Hill near Mollusk with Geological Survey NI, who maintain these mines. Morning, Kieran. Morning, Gordon. How are you? Doing good. What's the plan of attack today? Well, what we're going to do is look at uh, one of the old iron ore mines and bauxite mines in Northern Ireland. There's a network of these across County Antrim. Hundreds of them around the country. There's uh, roughly two and a half thousand old mine workings throughout Northern Ireland in different places. County Antrim was specifically on the iron ore and the bauxite, where the industry really took off in the middle of the 19th century, steadily declined in the early 20th century. However, it was reappeared again in the, during the Second World War. There's a real maze of tunnels to see today. Yes, this is an original main plan when it was uh, the, the main closed up. This is from 1945. This is where we stand just outside this entrance here. Um, as we look at the plan, it's 650 metres long, 350 metres wide, and there's almost nine kilometres of tunnels on the ground here. we take a look? Yep, let's go. We're heading into a subterranean world rarely visited today. So, Kieran, what are they mining in here, then? Well, this mine was uh, first driven into the hillside in 1880 for iron ore. Mm -hmm. uh, closed down in the early 1900s, mm -hmm. and then it was reopened again in 1942 for its bauxite properties. You can see here on the, on the rock, you have the iron ore seam, which is extending down. And what we have at the bottom here is a bauxite seam. Bauxite is a, a mineral ore, which is processed to make aluminium. And it was big in the war? It was much needed during the Second World War. There was demand increased. And therefore, the Ministry of Aircraft Production set about investigations to get reserves, because importing reserves wasn't, wasn't possible due to the, the U-boat threat. During World War II, 180 men were employed at this mine, producing 15,000 tonnes of bauxite per week. You can imagine what conditions would have been like to work back in the day. Yes, well, it all would have been done by hand, by pickaxe and shovel. And the, the mine itself would have been lit by candles. 
So what you see throughout the mine is a number of these carved out into the rock. These would have been done by the miners where they can put the candles so that they, they could work. No torches in the 40s? No torches, no electricity on the ground back then. Just get on down then. You'll get me lost. The mines are mostly used now by... Uh, different inhabitants. Yep, yeah, different inhabitants. Uh, badgers, foxes, bats. So wildlife is really taking over the space. While the public are advised to keep away, we're in here today under strict supervision along with bat conservationists working in a mine for the very first time. And looking in through the nooks and crannies, I found Dave. How are you? Hi there, how's it going? How are you getting on on the search for bats today? Ah, well, we've been quite lucky today. We've actually found a bat, so uh, that's a nice wee surprise because we didn't know whether we were going to find any at all down here today, so... And this is new for you, this whole experience getting in that mine? Absolutely. Um, we've never really looked for hibernating bats before in Northern Ireland or Ireland as a whole. So, um, yeah, anything that we find is, is exciting and new for us. So we've been very lucky, though. We've found a bat around the corner. So, um, yeah, do you want to go and have a look? And yeah, see let's, the let's go for it. You lead the way. Well, most people I know are scared of bats. What got you into them? Yeah, well, your friends wouldn't be alone in being frightened of bats. Uh, most people have quite a few misconceptions about them, from getting stuck in your hair and carrying disease and things like that. But uh, no, I think I think they're amazing little creatures. And are there many different types of species in Northern Ireland? Where would you generally find them? So we've got um, eight different species um, of bat in Northern Ireland. Um, there's nine in the island of Ireland as a whole. Um, where would you find them? Well, at this time of year, down mines because they're going to be hibernating uh, places like this because generally bats are only active in Ireland uh, during the summer, spring and summer months. Um, when you come into winter time, they go into hibernation. They're looking for nice, cold, cool places like this. So this is the, the hibernating bat. So we just found one and he's he's hanging in the, the top of the chamber here. Um, I feel like I need to keep the voice down, not to disturb. Yeah, I think we, we, we'd, we'd really don't want to uh, disturb hibernating bats because um, at this time of year, there's not many food resources for them. So if they do wake up, they've got to use all their food resources that they've uh, uh, saved up for the winter, just like hibernating bears. It's a myotis bat, which is, we've got three species of those in Northern Ireland. So um, this is one of the species of bat, which in Britain, that they monitor populations by going down in mines like this uh, and looking for them. So this is kind of exciting because we've, we've never done it. We've never found hibernating bats like this. So hopefully this will be the first of many adventures underground that we'll be taking. He's in bad heaven up there, isn't he? Yeah, he's, he's having sweet dreams, very sweet dreams, hopefully. Nowadays, the miners may have gone, but thanks to their hard work, our native bats have a home. Kilkeel Harbour is one of the busiest in Ireland, with around a 1,000 people employed in the fishing industry there. Ruth Sanderson has been to the village to see how Brexit could affect their future. The fishing industry has been in decline throughout the UK for several decades. Yet, while other ports might be empty, Kilkeel bucks the trend. Around a thousand people are employed locally in fishing and its related businesses, and Kilkeel wants to keep expanding. These scallops here have been just caught a few miles off the, the Kilkeel Harbour here, so they're uh, fresh product just straight in from the sea. Around 20 tonnes of scallops get processed and are exported from here each year, mainly to France. The fishing industry famously was very pro-Brexit, yeah. very much wanted out of Europe, said it would be a lot stronger for the industry. But as a businessman who exports to Europe, what, what are your thoughts on it? Well, my thoughts on, on Brexit is it's going to be good for the fishing and the processing industry. Fishing ways that will get a fair share of the quota in the UK waters, mm. which will bring more raw materials into the processing market. Uh, and as well, the customers that I have been dealing with and talking to still want the product from the UK, still want the product from Northern Ireland. So I can't see a problem of selling our product into Europe. Even if, say, tariffs were introduced later down the line? Later down the line, that's something, the hurdle that we'll have to cross. But uh, I think the, the quality of the, the goods coming from Northern Ireland that, mm -hmm. that the European market will still want our product. We've looked further afield, uh, we've looked uh, at markets in, in China and in Hong Kong and, and the Asian market as well. So mm -hmm. it has given us a, a prompt to, 
to go farther afield as well. Now, a lot of people in food production are really panicked about Brexit because they rely on seasonal workers and a lot of staff, uh, especially from Eastern Europe. Yeah. Are you going to face that problem here? I don't think we will. I think there, there is a future for local people that they see the industry building, to see that there is a future and uh, that they're willing to, to invest now and, and want to work again at the harbour and they can see that there is a brighter future there. But it's not just a good deal from Europe which is needed. The harbour needs to physically expand if it's to make the most of any benefits Brexit might bring. Well, the endurance is part of the local fleet in Kilkeel and the endurance is undergoing a significant uh, modernisation mm -hmm. and re refurbishment. And behind me is a new ship that's been built for the Irish Republic. Um, and it's one of the great success stories about Kilkeel uh, that we're building boats, not just for the local fleet, but we're exporting them all over Europe. And do you have the capacity to build all the boats that you need to build if you're getting orders in from the south and from Europe and from... Well, this, this yard is actually outgrown mm -hmm. uh, itself. And the problem that we have is that there's uh, not enough capacity in Kilkeel mm -hmm. uh, for all the work that we could handle. And in fact, the marine engineers tell me uh, that about 50% of the work inquiries that they get, that's work that they have to turn away. So there's... Sorry, 50%, 50 of the work? The, the prospective work, when people come to ask yes. engineers in Kilkeel to work, you have to say, no, I'm sorry, we, we don't have the room. But you look at the geographical position of Kilkeel mm. in terms of the east coast of Ireland, we're right in the middle. So therefore, you can attract trade from the north, mm. you can attract trade from the south, and indeed, you can attract trade from the, the east too, because mm -hmm. we've got a boat here today from Fleetwood that's on the step. And the reason they come here is because we've got the facilities, we've got the engineers who have the expertise and everything else. So Kilkeel is a real hub, it's a real maritime hub, it's a real fishing hub. But the problem we have now is we don't have the capacity in Kilkeel, we don't have the infrastructure in order to handle all the inquiries and all the work that we could, we could be doing. And when you're in a situation where here in Kilkeel, uh, we've got three of the largest fishing vessels in the European fleet that are too big to get into this harbour mm -hmm. and have to base themselves in other parts of the, of the, of the United Kingdom. Mm -hmm. There's so much lost opportunity to Kilkeel, to County Down and the Northern Ireland economy. But that's amazing though, that you've got boats from Kilkeel which are too big to actually get into your harbour here. Well, absolutely. Like We have a new ship been built at the moment. Um, it's called the Voyager. It's owned by a local family. It's crewed by a local family. It's 100% private investment. Uh, but that ship is traditionally based in Shetland because there is no infrastructure in Northern Ireland to bring that ship into. Hiya. Hello there. For the ships that do land their catch here, a lot is riding on the Brexit negotiations. So what are you fishing for on this boat? Mostly prawns, mm -hmm. nearly all year round we're, we're targeting prawns. You and know. you're about to go out again, where are you off to now? We're going to head south again, back down to the Celtic Sea. Mm -hmm. it takes us about 20 hours steaming to get there. I take it you were pro-Brexit yourself? Yes, so definitely. Yeah. What, what are you hoping for well, going forward? Um, instead of being governed by Brussels, like Brussels tell us what we can catch, you know, when we can catch mm -hmm. it, you know, where we can fish. And I want us to take control and um, stop a lot of the European boats coming in, overfishing, overfishing our um, areas, mm -hmm. certain areas, um, big super trawlers, and you know. Um, but mainly, I hope that um, we can start looking after our industry ourselves when that sign Article 50. Hopefully, they don't sell us down the river again. And well, that's the fear. Keep us in the it? Yeah, mm -hmm. that is our fear. Mm -hmm. Like they use us as a bargaining chip keep some other things in Europe, you know, for whatever reasons, but that is one of our biggest fears. What fishermen here in Kilkeel and County Down want is absolutely a fair share of the opportunities that are within UK waters. Mm -hmm. But when a fisherman in County Down is asked on an annual basis to give up quota, to give up the quota that the scientists have recommended, that that should be given away to their colleagues in the Irish Republic, that's an EU rule. The deal needs to be fair. And when 75% of the waters in the IC um, are under the UK's jurisdiction, you tell me, mm. is it fair that County Down fishermen should have around 40% of the catches mm. in the IC? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. So what's the future for this harbour? Well, the future for the fishing industry in mm. County Down, and specifically Kilkeel, is bright. As I walk out round the quay second in Kilkeel, and I talk to fishermen, those guys are saying to me, there's a future, mm. and we're investing in the future. We're investing in the future for ourselves, and we're investing in the future for our children. 
So all the signs are positive. Not only could fishing in Kilkeel continue to grow, but it could bolster the entire local economy. So will the gamble to leave Europe pay off? Only time will tell. Trout are now common in our rivers and lakes, but because of declining numbers in the past, some still need a little help. I've been to the Ballanderry River to find out how a healthy trout population benefits the river's ecology. The Ballanderry River and surrounding area support an abundance of wildlife. But this river catchment has suffered from pollution. Worryingly low levels of fish stocks in the 1980s prompted the establishment of the Ballanderry Rivers Trust, who've made it their mission to keep this river system clean and healthy. Well, Mark, you're fully kitted out. Complete the shades. Tell us about some of the work you're doing today. OK, so what we're doing today is electrofishing. And the reason we're doing this is to catch larger fish to bring back to our hatchery so that we can take the eggs from them uh, and, and then grow those eggs on in the hatchery so we can breed fish to put back into the river again. And the shades so you can see rather than look cool? Yeah, they're not just to make me look cool, no. Uh, the shades uh, help me to see through the water. Uh, so at this time of year, uh, when we're looking for these fish, the sun's very low in the sky uh, and it reflects on the water. It's quite hard to see the fish and these help me to see right to the bed of the river. I didn't pay a lot of attention at school, but I'm pretty sure electricity and water doesn't really go too well together. Yeah, well, you learned the important <laughs> lesson then. You shouldn't mix electricity with water. So uh, nobody should really try this at home. Um, but it is um, the standard method that's used across Europe and the world. And essentially what we're doing here is just putting a very small electrical current, just enough. Uh, to attract the fish towards this lance that I have in the water. All day out on the river, time to get these guys back into the hatchery. I think that's a fantastic looking fish, uh, and hopefully she'll give us plenty of eggs to put down in the hatchery here. Frank Mitchell has 20 years experience in this hatchery and is going to show me how it's done. And if you just read, the skin should be loose here and the eggs are all lying in, in the cavity of the fish here. And if we just add a nice piece of pressure and the fish settles down, hopefully we should be fit to take the eggs from the fish. Now, you can see the eggs come from the fish. I'm no and, expert, but that looks good. Yeah. And uh, I suppose it's been a few years of practice to get this skill, mm -hmm. and you try to do it without harming the fish. Essentially, the cell wall of the egg has to open uh, to allow the milt in, and then we gently agitate the eggs so they all become fertilised. Are they getting lighter or is it just me? Yeah, you can see them getting lighter yeah. because they're getting fertilised, so they're actually starting to change colour. They're yeah, going down from red to orange. It literally does happen in front of your eyes. Breeding in the hatchery increases the chances of success by an incredible 90%. And a healthy fish population has a knock-on effect on the whole ecosystem. So these are freshwater palm mussels. And this is a globally endangered species. The freshwater pearl mussel is now only found in five rivers in Northern Ireland, and the Ballander is one of them. Uh, historically, we would have had thousands, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of them in our rivers, and we're now down to the last few thousand in each of those five rivers. But they're an unusual creature because they need fish to survive. So. The males and the females are sitting here in this tank and the male releases uh, sperm into the water, which is taken in by the female. Mm -hmm. And they're fertilised. And then the female releases microscopic muscles into the water. And it's at that point those microscopic muscles have to attach to the gills of a fish. And in our river, it's trout that they attach so to. So the big picture becomes clear. Yeah, absolutely. So if you don't have very good numbers of fish in the river, these guys haven't got a hope at all. So by redressing the balance of fish in the river, we're also helping to preserve these mussels and save them from extinction. And then we've put those fish carrying their precious cargo out into the Ballandera River to drop them on the bed of the river as it would have happened naturally. So what's the future looking like for the pearl mussel? Well, the future for the pearl mussel in the Ballandera, at least, is looking a bit brighter now because of the work we've been doing here. Uh, we've been able to release 
freshwater pearl mussel back to the river and we're just about to start a major reintroduction program. It's the end of the day and this is what it's all about, releasing these endangered mussels back into the river. What's the technique to pop them in? So it's not complicated, you'll be glad to hear. <laughs> uh, we have to make sure that we get it the right way around. So this is the bottom of the mussel here. Uh, where the hinge is at the lowest place, and then we put it facing upstream into the flow of water. So those mussels, believe it or not, do wiggle around in the gravel, and they allow oxygenated water to get to the fish eggs, and so very often where there's lots of mussels, more trout would survive as well. So it's a, a really close relationship the two have. Are these the days when you really feel that your work is really worthwhile? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. It's great when you can come out, get away from the computer, come out to the river, and, and this is making a real difference to the conservation of a globally endangered species. But not, not just for those mussels, but for all the people that live in this river system as well. That's all for this episode of Home Ground. Join us at the same time next week. We'll see you then. Bye-bye. Topical debate from BBC Gaelic tonight at 10 over on BBC Two Northern Ireland and Fockel Skur tackles mental health and the legacy of the Troubles.